our gracious Heavenly Father. Oh, what an unprecedented time that we're living. What prophetic times we're going through. I ask, Lord, that you would allow us to keep our minds and our hearts focused in the right direction. And that you would filter out all the foolishness, but just seal to our hearts the truth of your word that we might grow in grace and knowledge of you. Teach us, O oh Lord, to trust in you above all things. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Uh, we're going to continue on in our study in the book of Revelation, verse by verse. But I've got a couple of uh, announcements I want to make right here at the beginning. I want to move very quickly uh, today through this video. I've got a lot of ground to cover. Uh, before I get started, I want to just let everyone know out there that where the this ministry stands as it regards to everything that we see going on here in the United States. It's been a, the policy of this ministry, uh, well, basically since its uh, beginning, to focus, to keep our focus in the right direction and not become involved, uh, weighted down, bogged down by uh, current events. That's not the purpose of this ministry. There's plenty of other uh, videos that you can watch on that. Uh, first and foremost, that's my primary interest. Uh, second of all, I believe that's what we need more than anything today. If, if you're confused, if you're afraid, if you're, you're concerned about what's going on uh, in the United States and in, and in the world in general, you're not going to find the answers to your questions in any other source except in this book. Now, when it comes to uh, what's happened uh, recently uh, here with the, uh, the censorship, uh, I just want to let everyone know that uh, it's not going to be difficult for those of you who are interested in doing so. It's not going to be difficult for you to stay in touch with us no matter what happens. I ask that you go to blessedhopeforever.com, contact us, uh, leave us your contact information. Uh, it won't be shared with anyone, but at least we'll have that so that we can stay in touch in the future no matter what happens. Leave your contact information and, and a short message and I will do everything I can to respond to everyone who does that. So now we're going to continue on in our study. Uh, this would be part 19. I'm going to talk about seals 5 and 6 primarily, but uh, I really want to go back to the first seal, and I want to tell you why that uh, I am of the mind here at this point through my own personal study that the rider on the first horse, the weight of the evidence leans now more toward, and this is just my opinion, toward that first rider being Christ rather than the Antichrist. Uh, and so I want to tell you why I believe that is true, that it favors Christ. So I'm going to quickly go through the, the, the differences here. I've, I've somewhat tried to keep score and it just seems that Christ comes out on top. Uh, there, are the the main the main key words in uh, verse the verse verse one and two, the the first writer, the main the main key words are thunder, white, bow, crown, and conquer. And so I want to uh, focus primarily on those. Now. Uh, let me argue here for a, you know, just for a moment. Let me argue for this being Christ. As far as the thunder goes, I know I understand it's one of the four beasts' voice, but God's voice is often like thunder, and I believe the beasts speak on His behalf. Uh, white represents purity. Uh, the bow. I'm going to talk a little more about that 
God, in fact, is seen to battle with a bow. All right. And, and but what's more interesting about that is where we see that 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 mention. And that is in the book of Job. And uh, there's a relation, there seems to be somewhat of a, a little, it's, it's quite interesting, in fact, a little, uh, when, we, when we look at the, uh, the situation of Job and God's dealing with Job and how Satan was involved, it, it makes it even more, than, more interesting. And so I'll talk about, a little bit about that. Now, there's no mention of arrows. I pointed that out. But, but uh, I don't think that that implies just because there's no mention of of arrows, I don't think that that necessarily implies that the first writer didn't have any. Because there are other verses in which a warrior with a bow is mentioned in which there there's no mention of arrows, but you know that he had them. So I don't know how to put it any plainer than that. The crown was given uh, this writer. It was given him. It's a Stephanos. It's a victor's crown. Uh, we just recently see before this that his body, the church, gave him, Christ, their crowns. They cast their crowns before the throne. So that's a good argument for that. And, and the word conquer, well, Christ's conquering is permanent. And so therefore, in, in my understanding, I believe that it's, it's safe to say at least that the word best fits Christ. He returns again at the second coming on a white horse. That's there's a there's a point in his favor right there. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. We see him at the end of Revelation chapter 19. Uh, if we're looking at him, Christ as being the the rider on the white horse here in the beginning, that 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 makes sense. Uh, he's sovereign over all judgments, supremely sovereign uh, over all his judgments, the wrath. Uh, his wrath, as well as uh, the, the activities of the Antichrist. He has complete control over everything. Now, uh, as far as the thunder then uh, goes, again, the, the Antichrist or Satan is never said to have a voice like thunder. Never. never. You won't find it. Uh, white uh, represents purity. Uh, formerly, I, I thought that, well, maybe the white represents the fact that he's disguised. He's, he deceives. He comes on the scene. He deceives the world. Uh, he's, he disguises himself. Or, or the white represents a, a period of temporary peace. I don't believe that, that that makes as much sense as I did formerly. The bow Neither the Antichrist or Satan is ever said to go into battle, folks, with a bow. Never. You won't find one reference in the Bible where the Antichrist or Satan is ever said to go into battle with a bow. Or with poison-tipped, toxic, poison-tipped arrows, which you see in the Word in the original text. Okay? Crown... Uh, well, if, if, if it was true that it was the Antichrist, then he was given that crown. He was given a Stephanos. Well, who was he given it uh, to buy? I mean, who was it that gave it to him? Who gave it to him? And th as far as the conquering goes, we know that his conquering is temporary. So, and so that word there, conquer, it just bet, best fits Christ. So, once again, I, it, it might have been better if I just kind of went with my initial gut instincts, uh, you know, that, uh, and looked more deep, deeper into that, that this first rider on the white horse was more likely Christ than Antichrist, because that's kind of where I started out, and then uh, it just didn't, I don't know, I don't know what happened. It, 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 I don't think that I was, it was the traditional, the more popular view that it's the Antichrist. I don't think that's what drug me off in that direction. I just spent much more time looking at this since the last few video, videos. So that's now my position. Now, why is, is only the fourth rider on the pale horse named? The others aren't named. 
Now, I, I don't know if I can tell you that. Uh, his name was death. In fact, it's articulated in the Greek. It's the death. So why are the first three writers not given a name? Uh, I wrestled with that. I thought, you know, I just, I, I don't, I'm not sure that I can even offer an, an answer to that. But, but it's interesting to me that, and I believe it's, that, you know, the Holy Spirit wants us to take note of the fact that He's the only one that's named, or that the one who sits upon the horse is, was given a name, and that name is death. Uh, to kill with sword, famine, death, uh, beasts. Uh, I mean, the other writers, now if you take the first writer as Christ, the second and the third, okay, obviously cause destruction or cause death. It would, it would seem likely that they would. Why weren't they given the name death? Why only the the one the fourth rider on the pale horse uh, what I want to talk a little bit about is that the the Greek word translated bow is from toxon okay which that's where we we get a our English word toxic or poisonous so I want to talk a little bit about that now Revelation 6 2 is the only time that the word is used in the New Testament. And Strong's defines, the Strong's uh, Concordance de defines toxon as, uh, well, it's, it's from the base. The base word is, is ticto, which means to bring forth, to bear, produce, that is, you know, fruit from the seed uh, of a woman giving birth, of the earth bringing forth its fruits. Uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and so on. Metaphorically, it means to bear, to bring forth, okay? Uh, interestingly, the, the, the basic root, tox, means a curve, a curve. And an archer's bow is curved. The rainbow is curved. That's why I believe many people say, well, the bow there, uh, that the first writer has uh, is, you know, God's covenant, the rainbow, it's somehow tied in with the rainbow. Uh, doesn't necessarily have to be. It's just that the basic root, tox, means a curve. So an archer, on his bow is curved, the rainbow's curved, a man actually curves his body when he bows, or, you know, down, uh, as far as bringing forth being the root for toxin, we could say that, that is due to the fact that the bow brings forth or shoots forth arrows. That's the way I'm looking at that. And children in the Old Testament were actually viewed as arrows in, a fa in their father's quiver. You read about that in Psalms 127. Uh, Toxon, folks, cannot mean rainbow since rainbow has its own Greek word. I can't remember the name of the word right now, but it's a different word. Though the, the same Hebrew word for bow was used for both rainbows and for archery bows in the Old Testament, that it, that's true, but it's different in the Greek New Testament. The rider on the white horse is not carrying a symbol of a covenant, you know, like, you know, as you know, as the rainbow, you know, is. The rider is a mighty warrior on a war steed. Uh, and that sets forth the context. Toxon is the Greek word used in the Septuagint for the Hebrew word, okay, translated bow in the, in the Old Testament. And it's first used in regard to the rainbow. I do set my bow, that is my toxon in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. So we could translate this as, I do set my curve in the cloud. You know, a curve is an arch. But rainbow is not the primary usage of that, that word in the Old Testament. It's, it's mainly used of a man bowing down or, or an archer's bow, you know, which is, you know, either used for hunting 
or for warfare, you know, or both. Uh, there's a verse in Second Chronicles that says that, uh, and of Benjamin, Eliada, a mighty man of valor, and with his armed men, with bow and shield, 200,000. Well, notice in the words armed men with bow, there's no mention of arrows. But that doesn't mean that they are not warriors, if you follow what I'm saying. So if we say that Revelation 6-2's absence of arrows means that he's not a warrior, well, we have a problem. You know, bow, just the mention of bow alone infers warrior. And, you know, there's no need to mention arrows. Now, I got a, a message from someone that, that asked me, well, Steve, how can he be, Christ be opening the first seal and be the rider on the white horse? And uh, I just, I, 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 I commented back and I, and I said, well, for probably for the same reason that he can be in heaven right now and still, and still be standing next to you uh, you and your computer. Now, I'm, I didn't mean to, to act smart aleck or anything, but but uh, it, this you got to keep in mind. This is a vision that John saw that God is God. Jesus is God Almighty. That He is omnipresent. Okay. Uh, I have. I don't. I, I mentioned this before. I don't have a problem with Him opening the seal and actually being one of the writers in the seal. Because this is John's vision of what was to come, okay? And uh, I believe that the, this first writer, what we're looking at, is God Himself, Jesus Christ, going forth and conquering in the sense that He has control over everything else that occurs. Just as God had control over Job, okay? Or Satan, God had control over Satan when he allowed Satan to do what he did to Job. Are, are, are you following what I'm getting at here? And so uh, I'm going to go on just a little bit more with that and, uh, and try to maybe try to drive that point home. Now, a bow is mentioned 78 times in 75 verses in the Bible and over 50 times it, it's mentioned without arrows. And in none of these verses is the bow assumed as being without arrows. The very word toxin carries with it the idea of poisoned arrows. Okay, and it is from this Greek word that we get our English word toxic uh, and, and intoxicated. Uh, if you look at it in the Latin, the Latin word toxicus means poisoned. And in, in ancient Greece, fighters with, with bows would put poison on the points of their arrows. So it could be said then, I believe, it could be said that the white horse rider of, of verse 2 has a bow with poisoned arrows. Okay? Now listen to this verse from Job. Job 6, 4. For the arrows of the Almighty are within me, the poison whereof drinketh up my spirit, the terrors of God do set themselves in array against me, said Job. Okay? So, here God is pictured as an archer with poisoned arrows. Where is Satan or the Antichrist ever pictured as an archer? I, I can't find it, folks. If you can find that verse, please send it to me. God and His Son are pictured in numerous places as not only wielding a sword, but as an archer shooting arrows. And, and peace will come through the white horse rider in Revelation 19. The next three riders bring death and destruction. You know, and peace is not brought, but rather taken from the world. It is the peace that God has been giving, the peace that you have, the peace that I have, that I hope you have, the peace that we so cherish and, and, and treasure. 
you, you out there who know what I'm talking about, that peace, okay? I'm not talking about peace between the nations, peace between the wicked. I'm not talking about that. The peace that, that God has been giving, I believe He takes away in the day of wrath, okay? In fact, all through the tribulation, men are losing peace. And I understand that there's that other peace. There's the peace that, that He doesn't give. Okay, I believe it, it's all taken away. There's no peace, saith the Lord, unto the wicked. Just read Isaiah. So it could be the rider on the white horse is leading the charge of the horses that follow where we see Christ taking peace away through His toxic, poisonous arrows. Just because he doesn't arrive on the scene bodily doesn't mean that he's not he's just taking a step back and he's just sitting back waiting for everything to unfold the way that he's designed for it to and he, he doesn't he really doesn't have a hand in what's going on. I don't believe that. That's that's my personal take on this. And it's okay for you to disagree with that. Okay, I'm already at about 25 minutes. I, I gotta kind of push it along here a little bit. I want to talk because I want to talk about the fifth seal, martyrs. Okay. Uh, I want you to notice in looking at the fifth seal, where he, he saw under the altar the souls, okay, of them that were slain for the word of God. These are conscious souls, conscious, okay, just like Moses, Elijah, the rich man. And Lazarus, these were conscious folks, okay? They weren't asleep. I don't know how many times I've said that asleep means to be, if, if, if my neighbor dies and he's asleep in the Lord, he's asleep not, not in his own experience because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But from my perspective, he's asleep. From, from the perspective of those in which we leave behind, Okay, in their, from their perspective, we're, we're sleeping, but we're not sleeping. The souls under the altar, folks, were not sleeping. Okay, that's the first thing I want you to see. How long? They, they, look, they cried out with a loud voice. Okay, this is another thing. They, they had a voice. Okay, how long, O oh Lord, holy and true, does Thou not judge and avenge, okay? If we just stopped right there, we might be, you might think we're talking, we, we're talking about what's our feelings today concerning what's going on here, you know, just those of us among the living, but it's, that's not the context. How long? Dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, White robes, okay? They're clothed. These are not ghosts, folks. They're not disembodied spirits, okay? From their pers perspective, for in, in from their position in eternity, okay? Uh, they, they're not waiting to be clothed. They're not waiting to be robed. They're not disembodied spirits with a, Feeling like it was somehow that they're they're incomplete, that, that they're waiting on that, you know, that they're not naked under God's throne, under the under the altar. They're not naked under the altar, and that they should rest yet for a little season. Now, I personally believe that that's rest in Christ's finished work until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Okay? Man, I would love to go on with that. I, I really do. Uh, these, are, these are tribulation saints. We know that. The, the rich man spoke. Lazarus didn't. If you, if you notice, Lazarus didn't say anything. We don't even hear from Lazarus. Uh, the new creation, okay, as new creations, 
if we were to die, immediate presence with God. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And we have no memory of the old man. None. Those former things have passed away. If you're not a new creation, sad to say, the only memory that you'll have is of the old man. I don't, I don't think David will ha has any memory that he murdered Uriah. And, and I think it's the same with Uriah. If Uriah is redeemed, those former things are not brought to mind. Memory of the new, of, of the, of, well, the, the non-elect, those who are un, not redeemed, the, their memory, uh, the memory of, of just nothing but the old man alone, just that alone would be torment, I think, enough. Uh, they, these individuals, folks, under the altar, they had sight. They had emotion. Uh, if they're asleep, well, uh, if you go to John 17, we read that where Jesus said in his high priestly prayer, he said, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory. If these are individuals, folks, are asleep, they're not beholding anything. Uh, we know from 2 Corinthians that we have, we already have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. We will not be found naked. And so these souls under the altar are tribulation saints. Uh, it's amazing how many Bible uh, teachers, uh, commentators, scholars even, uh, who will try to make these individuals out to be the church. They're, they're, they are not the church. They are tribulation period saints. In looking at the sixth seal, uh, if, if you have that, if you're looking at it in the King James Version, you'll see the, the, the word terror uh, you know, uh, mentioned as a, as a title there. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about that. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal and there was a low, there was a great, the word is mega in the Greek, a single mega, one single mega quake, mega earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair and the moon became as blood and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth Okay, I've, I mentioned how I believe that everything here describes a polar shift. It's, it's how that the, the stars would appear to fall from the heavens. We know that stars, which are light years away and, and in many times uh, greater than the size of the earth, could not fall to the earth. That's not, that's not what John is, or that's not what the text is saying. It appeared that way, and that's how it would appear. If there were a polar shift, that's how it would appear. It would appear as if the stars were falling from the heavens. Something really shakes the earth. And I'm not sure that th this great earthquake was not, the single mega shaking was, is not the whole earth, okay? The whole earth. In fact, that's how I'm looking at that. And the stars of heaven fell onto the earth, even as a fig tree casts her untimely figs when she's shaken of a mighty wind and the heaven departed as a scroll again polar shift when it's rolled together and every mountain and island were moved out of their places well that i don't think that the mountains and the islands were literally you know took off and grew legs and walked off okay this is a polar shift folks in john's vision what he was shown was is that these mountains and islands were moved out of their place. Well, the way that they're moved out of their original place is not that they were moved out of their original place. It's that the earth has, the balance has been severely disrupted. I believe this is a most definitely a polar shift.
and the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman, every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, they said, they, not to God, they said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Both, okay? For the, the great day of his wrath has come and who shall be able to stand? Great day. We're looking at the great tribulation period. I want you to take note of the fact that these individuals, and this is all inclusive, they they know they seem to know a lot about what's going on. Okay? The text makes it clear, absolutely clear, that they know that the great day of his wrath, God's wrath, is come. They know it. Okay? And they say to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us. Now the reason that you would normally, typically, in our own minds, the way that we tend to think is that we, you know, you, individuals who go and, and run underground and hide, like we have a cellar when tornadoes come through here, and uh, I call that our little hidey hole, hole. And the reason we go there, and I hate going there, but, but the reason we go there is to be safe. Okay, we, we want to survive. Folks, I don't think that's what we're looking at here at all. I don't think that the text will allow, well, at least in, this is just my opinion. This text will not allow me to assume the position that the reason why they go and hide underground is to remain alive or to be safe. Everything in, in, in these words, everything that I'm reading here, tends to point to, toward the fact that these individuals are going there for one reason, okay? It's not, it's not to remain, to survive what's going on, okay? It is not to survive. It's not. They're going there for, for the rocks and the mountains to fall on them and hide them from the face. It's, Maybe you're seeing what I'm talking about. Maybe you're not. I, and I'm, I have a very difficult time sometimes explaining what I, I see in a verse. I don't think that their attitude is one of survival ability. I think their attitude is one of, I mean, if I thought, folks, that the Lord was angry with me, I'd want to die. And... Uh, there's a lot I could say also about the fig tree. You know, the fig tree and the, and the fig tree generation, which is the common view, uh, and even the view that I held for, for years and years was that, you know, the fig tree generation, well, you know, that's got to be, you know, Israel reborn, 1948. Uh, you know, so we got to go, you know, what, 60 years, 70 years, uh, whatever, however many years, a generation, and that's, you know, the, the period... That's the fig tree generation, and you know it's, and we try to calculate, you know, his coming by that fig tree generation. Folks, the more and more I grow in knowledge of this book, uh, it, it's I, I I tell you what, if I could write a book today, and I don't have the time to do it, but if I if I took the time to write a book, I could write a book probably as thick as this on uh, the errors that I've grow, had to grow, grow out of, okay? Uh, you can't keep moving the goal post. That's, that's one thing about this fig tree generation. Well, it's 60 years, and so, or it's 40 years, and if he doesn't come, now we move it to 60 years. If he doesn't come, now we move it to 70, and then to 80, and, and we're approaching, you know, we're approaching this, this generation of 80 years, 1948 to 2028, that's 80 years. You subtract seven years of the tribulation, that's 2021. Rapture, he's got to come, okay? Now, I think there are other reasons, and in fact, there are. There are many other reasons, folks, for us believing here at Blessed Hope Forever that the rapture will occur 
in 2021 and quite possibly the spring. This is, this is where we've been uh, as far as the timeline for several years now. But I'm not so sure that the fig tree generation describes a period beginning at, with ni at 1948. I don't think the fig tree really has anything to do with Israel at all. Okay? It, the fig tree parable, the parable of the fig tree, it's, this is a parallel passage. Okay? What we call a parallel passage in the Gospels. You see it in Matthew 24. You see it in uh, Mark 13. And you also see it in Luke 21. There's something interesting about Luke 21. In Luke 21, it's behold the fig tree and all the trees. Not just the fig tree, all the trees. Okay? Without devoting an entire video to this, let me, let me just try to explain it this way. What I, what I think the fig tree generation, how I would explain that in... 30 seconds. <clears throat> when you see these things come to pass, know that this generation will not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. What, what is that? Is that now? No. I do not believe that is now. I believe that describes the period of the day of the Lord, the beginning of our study here in Revelation. The church is gone. The day of the Lord has, has arrived, has begun. That seven-year period of tribulation, is, which is known as Daniel's 70th week. The church was a mystery when Jesus was speaking this parable. Okay? The church was not in mind. It was a parenthesis. Okay? It was a mystery. This parable of the fig tree, folks, it, it, it has really, I don't believe it has anything to do with a beginning point at Israel's uh, new birth in 1948. We have to count so many years and, and well, and I don't know what happens if it goes past 80 and he still hasn't come. I don't believe that's what it's talking about. When, the, when, when these leaves shoot forth, you see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. So likewise, when you see these things come to pass, know ye that what? The kingdom of God is nigh. Why? Because, why? because you are in the tribulation period. And no wonder it says this generation. What generation? The generation of the, the tri those alive in the tribulation period, folks. It's this generation will not pass away till all be fulfilled. And in this sixth seal we see that the stars of heaven fell onto the earth even as a fig tree casts her untimely figs. Okay? When she's shaken of a mighty wind. I want, so I wanted to, to point that out. Well, look, I am out of time. Folks, I love you all. I'm, 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 you know, if I had, if it was my intention to uh, rant you know, about everything that's going on on some YouTube channel. I know I could get a lot of more views. But folks, I just don't know what good that would do. Uh, we are to redeem the time because the days are evil. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on, I know, and a lot of you are, are, are very interested in that. And, and I'm, I can't tell you that I, I'm not going to sit here and say I'm not interested in that as well. I'm not going to devote a whole lot of time to analyzing it, is what I'm trying to tell you, okay? Uh, I've got enough work to do right here. Most verse-by-verse -verse expositors, Bible verse-by-verse -verse teachers that, are, that teach through the book of Revelation, the average time to do that is two years, okay? I've, I've determined, Lord willing, I've tried to, to set, at least as a goal, to get through this book by the end of May or by mid-May. I've got my work cut out for me. So I'm going to stay focused on that. doesn't mean that I don't take a look at what's going on, but I just, uh, you can get all that information, all that, anal that analysis elsewhere. You're not going to find that here. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Please stay safe out there. 
Oklahoma's run out of hospital beds. They're sending us now to Missouri. Uh, there's no telling what's going to happen, but we know who is in control. And we can trust him because he does all things well. Look, folks, he loves you. He, uh, I, I, don't, I don't have the words to describe. None of us do just how much he loves us. Folks, we can rest in that and confident, the confident assurance that he has our best in mind. And that there is a brighter, much brighter future that lies ahead. Until next time, this is Steve. Thank you for all of your messages, your prayers, uh, for my health, for this, the direction of this ministry. I ask those of you watching this who are elders of this ministry to please join us on MeWe. Join in on the, the elder group chat there on MeWe. Uh, until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.